I couldn't remember the script, and so I'm trying to remember how am I going to deal with this. And part of my speech was, uh, has to do with the worst that can happen. And so I started thinking about it, and I thought, I'm an artist, so I'll explain it in a minute. And memorization is the last thing I did. And so I remember that from school, I remember how I did my algebra and biology for that reason. So here I am, and I just went blank before my speeches. But having gone to the worst that can happen, I have, I'm ready for you. So you, you don't know me, I don't know you. So let's just start with a QA. You want to go in, right? I'm my name's up there, so you know I'm Timothy kind of Chambers. And basically, there's three things about me that make who I am. Um, I'm nearly deaf, I'm nearly blind, and I'm an artist. A really interesting combination. <laughs> so we'll start with the first two first. Um, about, I have about 20% of the hearing that you have. I can't hear it without my hearing aids. The world is really quiet. Peaceful, actually. <laughs> actually. And in fact, when I paint, I tip them off sometimes. And there have been times at home where someone's talking to my wife, like, you didn't hear a word I said, did you? I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so the other thing about me is, uh, I'm nearly blind. I used to have the kind of vision that most of you probably all have, you know, that is, you can see about 180 to 200 degrees back here. And I'm down to about, you know, 17 degrees or so, maybe more like 15. So if I'm looking at you, if I was angry, there'd nobody else here. So you're quiet. You know, all of a sudden I see everybody. And the other thing about me is I'm an artist. And um, I've been an artist forever. Um, I paint, I earn my living painting portraits and landscapes. I still do. And uh, I love it. There is, when I'm painting, I'm totally in my element. I grew up watching my dad paint, and he does amazing things with the brush. We're both professional artists, and growing up I knew that's what I wanted to do. To me, the creative process is exhilarating, and there's nothing like it when I'm drawing. And so, that's what I went to school for, that's what I trained for, and by going back to where all of a sudden the story changed, about 24 years ago, this is when my career is really starting to take off. I was winning awards, things are going great, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be paying portraits for the White House, it's going to be great. Well, I went in for a routine night checkup, and uh, one thing I turned out of is said, something's not quite right. They sent me to a specialist, I went through a battery of tests, and the doctor comes in, and uh, he says, um, yeah, that's just I'm like, what? Yeah, you're, you're going to go down and die. I'm like, no, 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 no. Here's my portfolio. I brought it with me. I showed him my portfolio. I got all my paintings in it. And he took it. He glanced through a few pages, snapped it shut, thrust it back in my hand, and said, sorry, you better find another progression. And uh, even now, I still feel the pain of it. It's out there. It's just it was like someone had just erased my future and with it my entire sense of purpose. I thought if I can't see you or hear how or am I going to experience life, let alone respond to it with pain. So I don't think I slept over two years after that. I would wake up in the middle of the night, 2.30, 3.30, 4.30 in the morning, and the cold sweat just terrified of what they had. Um, so I'm just at a loss. But there was one night where Kim and I, my wife Kim and I, were talking, and we were reading, and I was testing what I could see. And so I'm looking at the book, I see a word, and I moved my finger outwards until I couldn't see it, just a couple inches. And I said, look, this is, this is all I can see. She said, you know, and then her, her response began a transformation within. She said, you know, Tim, I know this is hard. I know. And Kim is a strong woman. She's 
That's why I agree with you. Or like, I didn't marry someone who said yes to everything I wanted. In fact, we're either fireworks or we're dynamite. <laughs> but here, her tenderness came out. She said, Tim, I know this is hard. Now, but you're not an 80 year old man who's fading away with you know, something like Alzheimer's or something. You're very much alive. And she said, remember the promise that we both hold on to, that God said, I will never leave you for safety, which I interpret to be, I will always be your friend, and I will always be here. And she said, let's build on that promise. So shortly after that, I was talking with a mentor friend of mine, and I told him what had been happening. And he said, hey, well, what, what's the worst that could happen? I remember that moment, I was thinking, I can't believe you asked me that question. That's exactly what I don't want to Tell me. I said, I'm afraid that I'm going to be relegated to some corner of the house, deaf and blind, just waiting for someone to come and touch me and see if I'm still alive. Just wondering, thinking there's no purpose, you know, what is the point? And I said, you know, um, for one thing, I don't think that would have happened. Kim would never let that happen. And secondly, you have too much creativity in your voice to just disappear. It'll come out somehow. So, the interesting thing about that, that I appreciate the encouragement, but the thing that really, really attacked me was this question. Because I didn't go where I was afraid. I, I just left that part of the Besides, I knew where I was going. I knew sometimes as a little kid, I'm going to be an artist. If I don't play for the Cubs, I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> so, the Cubs thing didn't ever pan out. I was not the Little League by the time I was, you know, whatever. They said, hey, can you try another sport? But, um, so I knew where I was going. But if I, if I looked at my friend's question, and I thought, if I, instead of avoiding my fears, what if I faced them? And if I did what he said, if I went to where, what's the worst that can happen, and I found peace there, then I might get through it, and I might be able to face anything. So for a person who always knew where I was going, and I always knew who I was, and to suddenly not have to become the doctor, I mean, that was pretty, talk about bad bedside man, you just said, sorry, go find another profession. Um, had gone to a place where all of a sudden there's nothing. You know, you feel like you're in the dark, you're, Everything that you built on is gone. And to find peace there, I, I really can't cover that there's nothing like it. All of a sudden, if you can be there, then you really can't do anything. So, I began to try to look at my life and see what I had built on to that point. And I realized that one thing I couldn't do was, I didn't know how to identify my fears. So I had to figure that out. A school once asked me to teach an online art course. And I was like, that can't be done. I mean, give me a break. Art is a studio thing. It's like, hey, you see that? Okay, draw. And you don't need like six words to teach art. But I thought, okay, I'm up with you. I'm going let's give this some thought. So I thought, if I could articulate and identify the abstract art concepts in such a way that students could grab onto, you know, using analogies, and even for me, I would think, Something that I just took intrinsically, and all of a sudden I described it. I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Not that I'm cool, but just an amazing thing. Well, I took a shot, I did the class, did the course, and the amazing thing happened. The students learned more in the online lessons than they ever did in my studio or their workshop. So I thought, okay. So I started applying that to my fears. And I started just, instead of being you know, away, I started to try to identify them, put them into words. And the other funny thing is, I can write. I didn't know it then, but words are delightful. And I think I got that from my parents. You know, they delighted in words, and all of a sudden, the concept of wonderful about words, so all of a sudden, and it's really like I have a superpower, because all of a sudden, this big nemesis, this invisible fear, which I couldn't fight, and it was overwhelming and daunting, all of a sudden, it started taking the shape. I could see it for what it really was. 
And if I can see something, I don't know what it is, but I think anyway, is if you can see something, then all of a sudden you can identify it. But what you don't know is it's very clever, right? So I started thinking about things, and one of the things I realized was that I have been running bits towards something straight in the future. And I was running 100 miles an hour towards it. Well, that goal, I was going to be a great artist someday. And then when I got that diagnosis, suddenly I wasn't. I didn't know. And what I realized in the future is nothing more than a mirage. Now, it could happen, but you really don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen next week, next hour, right? So that was a big change. And so then I began to slow down. And you know what I noticed? I discovered people. Because when I was running full speed through the future, the past, the present was sitting by so fast that I couldn't take it in. But I mean, I knew what I was aiming for. That was really what mattered. I wasn't a jerk or anything. I was like, yeah, that's great. You know? But I was aiming for something. But when I slowed down, I started to discover some people. And when I discovered people, I found stories. <laughs> stories that were rich with past failures. People are afraid to say, I failed with something, but it's okay. I discovered them, and then I discovered that people learn lessons from them. And then they also discovered joy, like I was discovering, you know, that peaceful place to be. So things are changing. I'm starting to have notice the present and notice the people. Before I was diagnosed, um, I used to be uncomfortable around someone who was disabled. If I saw a child with a disease or somebody in a wheelchair, you know, I was at a store, it just didn't fit in with my future right here and there, so I would avoid it. But then, when I was diagnosed, I realized I, realized I became one of them. I, dis I had a disability, and I didn't quite fit in anymore. There was a guy, uh, at a store who was in a wheelchair, and I used to avoid it. But now, empathy was starting to rise up. And I, I saw him out this time, and went up to him and I said, I saw his name tag, and I said, hey, Lewis, uh, do you mind asking me what happened? Why are you in a wheelchair? There's a point in the question where you don't know, know me yet, but he looked out at me with a warm smile and said, you know, thank you for asking. I lost my arm and my legs when some friends and I stepped out on a landmine in my country. My friends all died, and I laid there for two hours before someone found me. Because I think I'm going to do that in my life. Now that's, that's something to a guy who thought he knew he was gone and all of a sudden didn't have anything. Here's a guy who a million times worse than what I had, and he was thankful to be alive. So I started thinking about it. And being a painter, um, you know, we have the palette of colors, and, and you paint. You pick colors and you put them on there, and, and that's what you do. You put a color on and you respond. That's how you create beautiful things. Or two of the things on my palette, as I just mentioned, were what? Fear, and, I'm sorry, yeah, fear and future. I was afraid. But I was aiming for something, so I did good. Why do you play those two colors with curves and presence? Huge difference. And the empathy in me, compassion started coming out. Instead of people that I would ignore, all of a sudden I started adding compassion, eye contact, um, a kind word, an initiated handshake, and transparency. And all of a sudden, I was painting light, the present, which colors of vibrancy. There's a painting on my easel now that's um, of uh, Dr. Kizahan and a young Yazidi woman named Yasmin. The story that I read was um, Yasmin was one of 1,200 people from Syria and Iraq that Dr. Kizahan and his team had rescued and brought back to Germany to provide. Um, physical, mental, and emotional healing. 
I don't know if I can see it there, but the painting, here's Yaki's story. She, by the time she was 14, she had been raped at least a dozen times by ISIS soldiers. And so I remember reading the whole story and the anguish that she felt. But she, at one point, she thought she overheard, she was in a refugee camp at this point, and she thought she overheard one of the boys of one of the men who had raped her. And she couldn't take it anymore. She doused herself with gas and set herself on fire to make herself undesirable. And so in the painting, <clears throat> she looks off, and she really does look like um, someone from a horror story. Her ears are burned off, her nose is half gone, her lips are half burned off, her uh, eyelids are gone, she looks off. But this time, I saw her as someone so beautifully and wonderfully made, someone who's beautiful. And so I wrote to Dr. Kilderham. I couldn't believe how quickly I found his email, but I found it. And I said, hey, I've been moved by your story. I'd like to share that with other people. Can you, I do a statement portrait? He wrote me back within 12 hours and said, we would be honored. I said, Yasmin, too? He said, she would totally be honored if you would tell this story. The painting is called, and I've given a title of it. I think it's amazing how it came, but it's said, uh, please don't look. But that was part of what I had read. She said, oh, I just dreamed that someday kids won't scream when they see me. And she's like, please don't look. The rest of the title is, please don't look away. Dot, 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 away. That's the other side. We don't want people to ignore us, but at the same time, we want people not to, not to ignore us, but at the same time, we don't want them to look away. We want them to say, I see you, you're a person of dignity and beauty. I want to talk to you, I will touch you, I won't be afraid. And so, to me, it's need to have actually a purpose all of a sudden, and much greater than I ever had before. I'm hoping that that painting, maybe with other artists or something, that I can get a traveling exhibit that crosses across the U.S. and people will begin to see people the beauty. You know, the pictures of people who we avoid, people who don't fit in, and they can see how beautiful life it is and make it for other people. So I thought I should wrap this up, <clears throat> and I had a few things to learn. Basically, I would say that I have learned that if you are identified with obstacles, right, you can overcome it. It's much easier to find something you can see that you can't. I've learned that my heart is much more balanced in the present than it ever was by the future. And I've learned that weakness is not something to be ashamed of. And that anyone for this actually is something that gives you something worth living for. So if I was to ask you to join with me in something I've learned, if someone would say something, I would say, hey, I'll be there for you. And I meant it. But usually life is too fast. And if you have to go, oh, I'm sorry, I missed you. But, but I, I'll be there with you. Or maybe you could join with me and change it to say, I am here. 